Thank you very much. Well, it's a great honour to be invited to give an F.D. Morris lecture, so thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for attending. So, Westminster and the wider world, the reach and impact of British coronations. This is the structure of my part of the lecture. So I want to begin uh, with introduction, a thesis refuted. In 1983, as both editors and contributors, Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger published what has become a famous collection of essays entitled The Invention of Tradition. It had been reprinted 21 times by 2013. One of the volume's most celebrated pieces was written by David Canadine. It's called The Context, Performance and Meaning of Ritual, The British Monarchy and the Invention of Tradition, circa 1820 to 1977. Now, although Canadine's thematic coverage is broad, coronations feature pro prominently amongst his royal events. Pulling all the threads together across both themes and events, um, he's ad he advances what may initially seem to be a compelling thesis. It is that there were four distinct phases in the development of the ceremonial image of the British monarchy. I now quote his own summary. The first period, extending from the 1820s and before to the 1870s, is a period of ineptly managed ritual performed in what was still preponderantly a localised, provincial, pre-industrial society. The second, beginning in 1877, when Victoria was made Empress of India, and extending until the outbreak of the First World War, was in Britain, as in much of Europe, the heyday of invented tradition, a time when old ceremonials were staged with an expertise and appeal which had been lacking before, and when new rituals were self-consciously invented to accentuate this development. Then, from 1918 until Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1953, came the period in which the British persuaded themselves that they were good at ceremonial, because they always had been, a belief in large part made possible because Britain's former rivals in royal ritual, Germany, Austria and Russia, had dispensed with their monarchies, leaving Britain alone in the field. Finally, since 1953, the decline of Britain as a great power, combined with the massive impact of television, suggests that the meaning of royal ceremonial has once again changed profoundly, although as yet the outlines of this new period can only be dimly discerned. The reader is set up to find his thesis persuasive by two opening quotations wrenched from their contexts and said to exemplify contemporary attitudes. The first is drawn from an 1820 publication called The Black Book, in which the author ostensibly argued, and this is Canadine's paraphrase, 
that as the population was becoming better educated, royal ritual would soon be exposed as nothing more than primitive magic, a hollow sham. For, says the Black Book itself, the real object of government is to confer the greatest happiness on the people at the least expense. Canadine's second introductory quotation comes from an anonymous 1861 periodical article attributed to Lord Robert Cecil, the future third Marquess of Salisbury and Prime Minister. In this passage, the writer complained that however splendid English ceremonies might be, there was always some little snag to, quote, ruin it all by making everything appear, quote, ridiculous. Straight away, one perceives difficulties. Ruin it all for whom? For a perfectionist, perhaps. And Canadine's bold identification of the ceremonial image of the British monarchy raises further problems. Isn't an image like beauty in the eye of the beholder? Whose image are we talking about? But before I get down to refuting the first part of Canadine's overdrawn and misleading thesis, let us pause to examine the reasoning and evidence deployed to support it. Having stated that the theatre of power had been closed down to the monarchy by the end of the 17th century, Canadine begins by asserting inconsistently that continuing royal power made grand royal ceremonial unacceptable. To whom it was unacceptable is not revealed, presumably politicians. Next, we are assured that renewed royal unpopularity rendered such elaborate events impossible. Members of the royal family are said to have been viewed with indifference or hostility because of George IV's extravagance and womanising, not to mention the sordid public collapse of his marriage to Queen Caroline, William IV's antipathy towards the reformist Whig government, Victoria's partiality for Prime Minister Melbourne, and the many social scandals with which the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VII, became embroiled. The only primary sources adduced as evidence for this supposed unpopularity are one newspaper, The Times, and one periodical, The Spectator. So the view represented here was narrow, to say the least. Canadine's third point, which, as we shall see, has some merit, is that since, and I quote, politics and society were quintessentially London-based metropolitan activities, the ceremonial appeal of the monarchy was only further circumscribed. For between the age of Wilkes and the age of Chamberlain, the national influence of London was relatively restricted as provincial England reasserted itself. Local loyalties and rivalries remained strong. The county community was still a cohesive and realistic unit. In such a localised, provincial, face-to-face -face world, the scope for presenting a ceremoniously enhanced monarch, Olympian, aloof and detached, as the father figure of the nation, was distinctly limited. However, the provinces and the metropolis were never hermetically sealed from each other, as Canadine implies. Has he forgotten the politics of the country house party? And, of course, the London social scene was, well, seasonal. Parliamentarians and socialites did, on and off, go home. Thanks to its alleged endemic hostility to the institution, our analyst proceeds to identify the press, not only metropolitan but also provincial, um, as a barrier to the development of a monarchy enhanced by ceremonialism. Moreover, the lack of pictures prior to the advent of cheap pictorial publications did not help, he insists, making even the greatest of royal ceremonialists something of a mystery to all except the most literate and wealthy. Clearly, this is to discount the detailed word pictures of an army of dedicated journalists and the non-print technological in innovations that brought coronations vividly to life for ordinary people. For example, in the early 19th century, as Jeremy Brooker and his colleagues explain, I quote, touring panoramas became increasingly common as moving image exhibitions. Unlike the 360 degree version, moving panoramas were scrolling canvases that were portable and could be wound across a stage. The coronation of George IV was the first to be taken up by the panorama form. As for Victoria, a panorama of her coronation could be found slowly wending its way from Dublin, where it was resident from October to December 1838, to Bristol and then on to Exeter, exhibiting there from May to September 1839. It was still exhibiting in Leeds in March 1842, nearly four years after the event. Yet Canadine, ignoring that kind of evidence, ploughs on. Under these circumstances, he declares sententiously, great royal ceremonies were not, to be much, not much shared 
uh, corporate events as remote, inaccessible group rights performed for the benefit of the few rather than for the edification of the many. Remote and inaccessible, those are ideas to which I shall return. When Canadine introduces the fifth aspect, the prevailing state of transport technology, one perhaps assumes that pertinent remarks about the ease or difficulty with which sightseers might reach the capital are to follow. But no, his interest is limited to how members of the royal family got about and the extent to which their carriages became fashionable, matters tangential to the overall argument. The sixth aspect is national self-esteem, such that competition with foreigners was unnecessary. The certainty of power and the confidence of success meant that there was no need to show off. An exaggerated claim for which the only supporting evidence is Sir John Summerson's 1971 swipe at mid-19th century governments um, and their parsimony over new public buildings. In any case, moving on to the seventh aspect, London, avers Canadine, was ill-suited to be the setting for Grand Royal Ceremonial. It had nothing to compare with what was going up in Paris, Rome, St. Petersburg, Vienna and Washington. But how many English folk were in a position to make unfavourable comparisons at first hand? Only a tiny fraction who were exceptionally well-travelled. Were the architectural adventures of those cities reported by the press here? I wonder. If country bumpkins, as Canadine all but calls them, could barely summon up interest in metropolitan doings, or so he thinks, then they're hardly likely to have been avid for news of houseman's exploits over the channel. Ignorance is bliss. The slovenliness of the capital, the historian argues, might even be regarded as a virtue on the grounds that its squares and suburbs, I quote, railway stations and hotels were monuments to the power and wealth of the private individual. Mid-Victorian London was a statement against absolutism, a proud expression of the energies and values of a free people. Grandeur in the style of Paris or St. Petersburg spelt despotism. For how else? Could enough power be wielded or funds mobilised to make it possible to complete such mammoth schemes? Those reflections cause him to conclude that the English love of freedom and economy and hatred of ostentation was the kiss of death for grand royal ceremonial. But wait a minute, what about this cartoon of 1831, ironically entitled A Cheap Coronation for the Good of a Trading Community? Wearing patched clothes and holding a ladle instead of a scepter, William IV is about to be crowned by Lord Grey with a candle extinguisher inscribed, an extinguisher to put out the splendour of royalty. Canadine's point can be turned on its head. Private enterprise welcomed royal ostentation because it did very well out of it. Finally, the relevant personnel he contends were simply not fit for purpose. They could not cope with routine religious services, let alone grand ceremonies. Mas successive masters of the king's music were undistinguished, cathedral choirs and that at the abbey were shabby, mediocre and unrehearsed, while the clergy, lacking in taste, were either indifferent or hostile to ritual. As the foregoing discussion indicates, much of Canadine's reasoning is unconvincing and his proof thin. But I now wish to highlight a serious methodological flaw Endowed, like all historians, with the benefit of hindsight, he has, unfortunately, fallen into the trap of presenting a deeply teleological account. For what is Canadine really saying? In essence, he's saying that the royal ceremonialism of phase two, which saw the exuberant invention of tradition, was both impressive in itself and a runaway success. To put it crudely, things got better. Yet because things got better, he supposes that they must have been irredeemably bad beforehand, with various consequences. Pre-revisionist scholars of the English Reformation made the same mistake. The arrival of Protestantism in the early 16th century must have meant that the late medieval Roman Catholic Church was spiritually moribund, its clergy corrupt and incompetent, and the laity disenchanted. All that has been exploded. Similarly, in assessing the performance and impact of royal ritual, it is wrong to judge the period from the 1820s to the 1870s, as Canadine does, by the standards of later periods. Establishing by what criteria the phenomena of the first phase ought to be measured would be a worthwhile exercise, but at its heart must be some safeguard against anachronism, the fatal sin of which Canadine is guilty in his slick formulations. In short... 
we should take a methodological leaf out of the revisionist book and evaluate royal ceremonialism before the putative watershed in its own terms, free from the condescension of posterity. Two, stuff happens. In pursuing that agenda, let us first dispose of the notion that 19th century coronations were uniquely marred by ineptitude. Mistakes there probably always have been. In 1714, the allocation of seats for peers' wives was insufficient. Countess Cooper had to seek a place on one of the bishop's benches, only to be pushed off that by Lady Nottingham. She was forced to sit on the pulpit stairs, but became thankful for her, the latter's, quote, ill breeding, because... I saw all the ceremony, which few besides did, and I own I never was so affected with joy in all my life. It brought tears into my eyes, and I hope I shall never forget the blessing of seeing our holy religion thus preserved, as well as our liberties and properties. In 1761, Horace Walpole wrote that the peeresses wandered about Westminster Hall indecently in the intervals between the forming up of sections of the procession to the abbey. After the coronation service, he said, during the banquet, the champion's three mounted associates were, he considered, woeful. When Lord Talbot, barely in control of his horse, managed to exit, said Walpole, the spectators clapped, a terrible indecorum, but suitable to such Bartholomew fair doings. On arriving at Westminster Hall in 1821, the, the artist Benjamin Hayden found tipsy doorkeepers and quarrels breaking out. Yet he rhapsodised about what ensued. I quote, Every movement, as the time approached for the king's appearance, was pregnant with interest. The appearance of a monarch has something in it like the rising of a sun. There are indications which announce the luminary's approach, a streak of light, the tipping of a cloud, the singing of the lark, the brilliance of the sky, till the cloud edges get brighter and brighter, and he rises majestically into the heavens. So with the king's advance, a whisper of mystery turns all eyes to the throne. Suddenly two or three rise, others fall back. Some talk, direct, hurry, stand still, or disappear. Then three or four of high rank appear from behind the throne. An interval is left. The crowds scarce breathe. Something rustles, and a being buried in satin, feathers, and diamonds rolls gracefully into his seat. The room rises with a sort of feathered silken thunder. Plumes wave, eyes sparkle, glasses are out, mouths smile, and one man becomes the prime object of attraction to thousands. The way in which the king bowed was really royal. As he looked towards the peeresses and foreign ambassadors, he showed like some gorgeous bird of the east. One of those foreign envoys was the American Richard Rush. He tells of a near disaster in the abbey. As it was being carried to the altar, the crown slipped from the hands of Lord Anglesey, but he dexterously recovered the precious object before it fell. Rush was forgiving. The gallant Marquis only had one leg, having lost the other at the recent Battle of Waterloo. For the diplomat, the incident was trifling compared to the splendour of the occasion. His party had reached Westminster Hall at about 8am. Quote, the morning was fine, which made the equipages and troops a brilliant sight. Even at that early hour, windows and front doors were crowded with people looking at the carriages of the ambassadors and nobility with richly dressed persons inside as they passed in procession to the grand pageant of the day. Rush was much struck by the action accompanying the moment when George IV was, was crowned. That of each peer putting on his coronet at a given moment, a movement done simultaneously and with military exactness and effect. It took us by surprise, seeming like a hundred coronations all at once. He waxed lyrical over the banquet, and especially the Duke of Wellington's dramatic appearance as one of the champion's mounted supporters. Nowhere was he more eyed than from the box where sat the assembled ambassadors of the potentates of Europe. Judging from uh, opinion in that box, there was nothing in the elaborate grandeur of the day to rival this scene. It was the inherent preeminence of a great man, exalting moral admiration above the show of a whole kingdom. I got home from it all by nine o'clock in the evening. Many, parts, many were detained until midnight, and illumination followed. In diverse parts of the town, fireworks were let off, balloons sent up, cannon made to roar, bells to ring, the theatres were opened gratis, and the whole night went off amidst the general huzzas of John Bull. Henry Hobhouse, 
Under Secretary of State at the Home Office, and therefore as much of an insider as Lord Robert Cecil would later be, wrote this in his diary. The coronation and its accompanying festivities have been attended with the happiest results. The day was beautiful, everything was conducted with the best order, no accident of the least importance occurred, and the public mind, which was previously well disposed towards the ceremony, was still further gratified by the opening of the theatres and the ascent of a balloon from the park and the exhibition of fireworks there and on the river at the public expense. Military exactness, elaborate grandeur, the best order, phrases hard to reconcile with Canadine's picture of ineptitude and tawdriness. According to one of Queen Adelaide's train bearers, there were several unhappy episodes in the 1831 coronation. The incoming procession kept halting in the aisle. The bishops dithered over which chair the consort should have occupied. William IV had nothing to give at the offering, and MPs sitting in the gallery over the altar behaved like unruly schoolboys. Nevertheless, Lady Georgiana Bathurst avouched that the effect of the organ striking up when the Queen had entered the Abbey was very fine, that nothing could be more perfect than her manner during the whole ceremony, that applause had echoed throughout the building when Wellington did <coughs> homage, and that Adelaide had been received most enthusiastically as she returned down the aisle. Lady Holland told her son that she spent the best part of the day watching the procession. The gorgeous sight was very gratifying. The king was most cordially greeted by his affectionate, attached people, looked happy and well. The Duke of Sussex, that's his brother, was cheered. I was sorry my derangement prevented me from enjoying the comfortable seats kindly allotted by the Duke of Norfolk, as the show in the Abbey was beautiful. Victoria's unrehearsed coronation in 1838 is notorious for its mishaps. As she related in her journal... The Archbishop of Canterbury was generally confused. The ring was jammed on the wrong finger. The orb was presented prematurely. And the elderly Lord Rolfe fell down the steps as he was attempting to do homage. But the Queen did not allow glitches to spoil the occasion. Advancing up the aisle, the sight, she wrote, was splendid. The crowning was, and I quote Victoria, a most beautiful, impressive moment. The shouts, which were very great, the drums, the trumpets, the firing of the guns, all at the same instant rendered the spectacle most imposing. At about half past four, I re-entered my carriage, the crown on my head, and the scepter and orb in my hands, and we proceeded the same way as we came. The crowds, if possible, having increased... The enthusiasm, affection and loyalty were really touching and I shall ever remember this day as the proudest of my life. Disraeli had not intended to go but did and was wowed. The pageant within the Abbey was without exception the most splendid, various and interesting affair at which I ever was present. To describe is of course useless. I had one of the best seats. Indeed, our House, House of Commons, had the best of everything. I am very glad that Ralph persuaded me to go, for it far exceeded my expectations. To him, the outdoor procession was rather a failure. It lacked variety, with neither sufficient troops nor sufficient music. Listen, however, to these words in an unpublished diary penned by a Gloucestershire farmer come to London specially to witness coronation festivities. He hired a standing place at a pub window, I was about on a level with the persons in the carriages and had a most distinct view of Her Majesty. She was looking exceeding well and her animated countenance gave her a very interesting appearance. From some occurrence, the cavalcade was stopped for some time just as the Queen had passed our window a few yards. This gave us a good opportunity of scrutinising the grand equipages. Many of the foreign ambassadors' carriages were very superior to the Queen's. After this wonderful procession had all passed, I went up into the drawing room. Having had lunch, he resumed his place for the return procession. And to my great surprise, within a few yards just below our window, Her Majesty's carriage was delayed, as before, for several minutes. I had again a very open view of her. She looked pale, thoughtful and fatigued. The number of magnificent carriages, the splendid trappings of the horses, their foot attendants, the different splendid liveries and the great variety of other circumstances combined surpassed all my powers of description. I did not hear or see the least tumult, and I should judge that such an occurrence, i.e. the procession, could not have passed off so orderly in any other nation in the world. Very little in this accumulated testimony substantiates Canadine's verdict about the first phase. In events as complex as coronation, snags are inevitable, but participants improvise and move on. Observers do not dwell upon minor imperfections. 
Only the ultra fussy get hot and bothered. Overwhelmingly, high and low, our writers were bowled over. Here again, their adjectives, joyous, brilliant, exact, elaborate, grand, orderly, happy, enthusiastic, perfect, gorgeous, affectionate, beautiful, impressive, imposing, splendid, wonderful, and magnificent. I move on to section three. A new thesis, coronations appropriated. Having rejected Canadine's characterization of the period before eight, the 1870s, I now wish to replace it with a new thesis, which goes on something like this. Obviously, in all ages, the Westminster Abbey congregation, ignoring foreign nationals, has been a minute and unrepresentative proportion of the sovereign subject. Prior to the coming of the railways, few will have emulated that Gloucestershire farmer in travelling to the metropolis. For the majority, the ritualistic detail of a coronation must indeed have been apprehended, if at all, dist distantly, at second or third hand, by hearsay, by newspaper reports, by panoramas, by photographs, by film and, in due course, by television. Until modern times, most people probably had only the haziest idea of what happens in a coronation beyond the crowning itself. But did that matter? Not everyone is as obsessed with monarchical ritual as Professor Canadine. And here is the thesis. Knowing that they could never to hope directly to experience the events played out in London Westminster, people appropriated the fact of a coronation and thereby made it their own. The myriad ways in which, through their own initiative, Britons chose to celebrate coronations communally amounted to an invention of tradition or at least the perpetuation of existing traditions long before the establishment set to work in Canadine's phase two. It is local ceremonialism with its priorities, dynamics, effects and significance that appears wholly to have escaped his notice. The evidence for the popular appropriation of coronations within the British Isles is vast. At Bath, the full day celebration to mark Charles II's 1661 coronation commenced with bell ringing and drum beating to summon such as would demonstrate their good affections to the king to show themselves in arms. With armed men lining the streets, the begowned mayor and aldermen processed to church in order to thank, quote, the king of kings for returning unto us and crowning this our unparalleled earthly king. Corporation members were followed by over 400 virgins who ushered the Lady Mayoress, attended by the wives of the aldermen and the common councilmen, to a special religious service, all to cries of God save the King. A sermon ensued. Afterwards, the conduit ran with claret. Later still, the night sky was lit up by bonfires and fireworks. In this drawing, Willem van der Velde, the elder, skillfully evokes the Thames Gala for the inauguration of James II in 1685. Honouring Queen Anne's coronation in 1702, St Ives, Cornwall, thrilled to a grand fate. Its centrepiece was a cavalcade. But the day had begun with bell ringing and music and, intriguingly, versing from door to door. To commemorate George II's 1727 coronation, Bath, Gov Bath's governors caused an ox to be roasted whole in the market square for distribution amongst the poor. Manchester pulled out all the stops at the time of George III's coronation in 1761. There was an enormous fancy dress procession constituted by representatives of the principal trades. The tailors, wool combers, worsted weavers, shoemakers, dyers, joiners, silk weavers and hatters. Some of the shoemakers appeared as Robin Hood and his men. In the evening, the town was illuminated and a ball thrown for more than 700 lucky Mancunians. As Griffin remarks, local worthies, acting privately if they had government posts, were often responsible for organising and financing small town events. At Castle Carey, Somerset, the 1761 coronation celebrations were paid for by Messrs Creed, Hindley, Potts and Duck. Bristol's grand civic procession on the occasion of George IV's coronation in 1821 was brilliantly captured by a watercolourist. Here, uh, here is one portion, there are five sheets um, all representing the procession. William Somerton published an accompanying poem. That same year, people calling themselves the Bards of the Tyne wrote coronation songs printed at Newcastle in 1822. Coinciding with Victoria's inauguration, a large fair depicted here opened in Hyde Park, where cheap paper portraits of the Queen could be bought advertised in this flyer. And I've made a comparison with modern values. 
Far away in Chester, between 2,000 and 3,000 children were feasted with roast beef and plum pudding. Arguably, the most spectacular municipal dinner of 1838 was to be seen in Cambridge, illustrated here, to the strains of an orchestra mounted on the stage at the hub and astonishing 15,000 diners. That's 12,000 poor citizens, 2,700 Sunday school children and 300 Sunday school teachers sat at long tables radiating like the spokes of a wheel across almost the entirety of Parker's piece. Common in the early 20th century, when Britain could boast composers of international standing, were coronation-themed concerts. For its commemorative programme in 1911, Booth Wells, Brett Noxia, chose Edward German's Coronation March and Frederick Cowan's Coronation Ode, while Devizes, Wiltshire, selected Edward Elgar's Coronation Ode and Frank Bridges' The Flag of England. One could go on. The local appropriation of coronations occurred internationally. For example, the English consul at Smyrna, now Itzmish, on the Aegean coast of Anatolia, invited expatriates to his home for celebrations, at our own charge, to mark Charles II's coronation in 1661. Some, though, had already arranged to hold festivities elsewhere. Nevertheless, when Lord Winchelsea's secretary fortuitously arrived in Smyrna that same day, as he related to his master, he had immediately been bidden to join the consul's party and found that the latter had put on a very handsome entertainment for the company, while the factor's guns had made the whole town aware of the rejoicing. Whatever the English colony in Leghorn or Livorno did to celebrate George I's coronation in 1714 remains to be seen, but the occasion was magnificent enough to have inspired an anonymous Italian poem in tribute printed as a broadside on fine red satin. Information about George IV, July 1821, inauguration inevitably took some time to cross the Atlantic. Yet when it did, the British residents of Boston, Massachusetts, sent by their consul a humble address, dated 1st October, congratulating the king on the recent auspicious and glorious event of Your Majesty's coronation. And the address, without signatures, was published in London in December. In a superb article, Bonnie Huskins has exposed the reinforcement of class distinctions in the 1838 coronation festivities in two spots of eastern Canada, the Common Council of St. John, lying on the coast of New Brunswick, allocated £115 for an exclusive corporation dinner. Although much more money, £332, was set aside for outdoor public feasts, expenditure per head in that direction must have been considerably less. The fare consisted of rocks, roast ox, half a pound bread loaves, plum pudding and ale. A newspaper reported that Carlton's feast, Carlton is a district of St. John, produced, quote, an effect on the people calculated to call forth the best feelings towards the parent state and our youthful and maiden queen. The Common Council's philanthropy extended to the provision of a special dinner in the jail. Unsurprisingly, given the era's moral reformism, there were objections to the availability of alcohol. They were defeated. Having said that, the St John Temperance Society laid on a tea and coffee soiree as a suitable alternative. Halifax, Nova Scotia, would not be incorporated until 1841. Its coronation festivities were therefore organised and funded by a combination of imperial and provincial officials and private citizens. Accessible only to the, to the upper crust, a marquee was erected on the common where Victoria's health was toasted with the utmost public in possible enthusiasm. The other end of the social scale, the inmates of the poorhouse, the jail and the bridewell were treated to a celebratory meal. One newspaper regarded what Huskins calls the voluntary offerings of the elite during Halifax's coronation jamboree as the contribution of all whom fortune has blessed with the means of bestowing happiness to others, adding that such gifts, quote, testify to the whole world how highly Nova Scotians value the privilege and honour of belonging to the British Empire, having a direct interest and concern in the grand constitutional ceremony which consecrates Victoria, our Queen. The story of local appropriations was no different in the 20th century. In April 1902, for instance, Bermuda's House of Assembly sent up to its Legislative Council a resolution for £1,300 to be defrayed on celebrations due to happen in these islands in connection with the coronations of Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. A film of the 1911 coronation procession was shown in Japanese jubilations 17 days after the event. Photographs testify to parallel festivities in Belize, a children's parade and the march past of a military band. Turning to Malaya in 1937, schools participated widely in commemorative ceremonies. 
Moreover, the Tamil headmaster of one English language school in Malacca used the distant coronation as an opportunity to essay a definition of Britishness. To quote Lynn Holland Lees, he found it compatible with ethnic diversity and with the equality of races. Here is the title of his pamphlet published in Kuala Lumpur, The Coronation Souvenir of the Settlement of Malacca, undertaking with a view to foster an everlasting interracial harmony and amity among the heterogeneous folks of this ancient settlement. What a noble sentiment. As presented by one of their own, concludes Lees, the Malaccan elite was proudly Asian and British simultaneously. And so we reach 1953, for which overseas revelries are amply documented. I display representatively a picture of a dragon float on the streets of Singapore. So, to conclude, whether they took place within the British Isles or abroad, there is no hint in the sources that the celebrations just described were instigated by Whitehall, nor that plans ever underwent government vetting. Of course, it would be naive to suppose that organisers and hosts did not have their own agendas, which clearly deserve analysis. Likewise, the complacence of a populace should not be assumed. Huskins notes anti-elitist voices in her Canadian towns. Indeed, a shadow account of critique and irreverence can be reconstructed. On another level, one could explore coronation festivities as a facet of the history of leisure, focusing on the modalities of leisure preference. Nevertheless, on the whole, the material deployed here indicates the widespread incidence of diverse communities freely making of coronations what they would, what they would. Inventiveness and the exuberance flowing from local pride came to the fore. Hierarchy endorsing ritual, certainly, yet also the joyous letting off of steam. Taking the long view, perhaps an inverse correlation can be posited, that as Canadine ceremoniously enhanced monarchy has flourished, aided and abetted by television and latterly the internet, so has the energy been sapped from what we might term the genuinely ancient tradition of DIY, coronation commemoration. The accession now of a much less popular sovereign naturally has something to do with it too, but compared to 1953, how many towns and village events will be unfolding on Saturday? Thank you, David. And uh, thank you, Professor Woodhead, for the opportunity to give these lectures, and thank you all for being here. It would have been remiss of us not to cover the impact of coronations and other such royal events, given the extraordinary events of last year and, of course, just a few days' time, what we often refer to as the ripple. Last year, I was forwarded an article in The Economist entitled The Platinum Jubilee, Land of Hops and Glory, the argument being that Britain is celebrating jubilees more often but less confidently. The piece lacked proper historical context, data, or very much at all. It was not written by Canadine. But it covered the important point of impact. How do we measure that? And why does any of this matter? It was, of course, also written before the events of the passing of Her Late Majesty the Queen and the news of the forthcoming coronation. From 17th century diaries to the present, people cared and continue to care about these events. We can't look into people's minds, but we can read what they've written and what was spent and study the statistics on viewing figures for royal spectacle. When we think back to September, I can picture Green Park and parks up and down the land and trees around the country and see that a monarch in the 21st century meant something very profound to people. Today, the Mao is already heaving with those hoping to get the best spots for the occasion. And just as there's always been, we have protesters and those not in favor of these events, making their voices heard. It's often forgotten that in 1714, there were major riots following the coronation of George I. Not in my name is not a new phrase. Turning to the 17th century, the London Gazette, though effectively a crown paper, its issue of 30th of April, 1685, noted that in Nottingham, the 23rd instant, being the day of their majesty's royal coronation, was observed here as followeth, with a military march, a mayoral parade, which was accompanied with acclamations of long live King James II and all expressions of joy. Not only was the town hall arranged for loyal toasts, but so too 
About all the crosses there were planted vessels of ale that the common sort might drink the king and queen's healths, which they did heartily. There were tables furnished for all comers. The day was spent in music and feasting, and the night in ringing of bells, bonfires, and fireworks, the town not sparing for any charge or pains to express their loyalty and satisfaction to be governed by so glorious a monarch. As David's pointed to as well, this street party style commemorations of more recent times would not have been so far removed from the celebrations of the 17th or early 18th centuries. Newspapers undoubtedly played their part in creating publicity. In this instance, they tell us more of what was going on in the country and indeed from a crown position, what they hoped was happening and what they wanted readers to hear. Bonfires and bells were certainly fitting and were part of beacon lighting in last year's Jubilee celebrations, ring for a king in this year's celebrations. In 1613, James I spent a sum of 2,888 pounds, hundreds of thousands in today's money, something like 60,000 days worth of skilled labor in Stuart times on fireworks alone for the marriage of Elizabeth Stuart. Coronations follow this pattern. Indeed, they're the summit of magnificence as the most important royal event of all. Most importantly, the atmosphere of these events evoked wonder and mystery captured in accounts and first-hand reports of people's experiences. It always seems to be this sense of splendor that David's picked up on. This is clear in modern accounts, especially in those of Elizabeth II since 1953. The procession was magnificent. The color and pageantry cannot be described. Uniform, superb, and resplendent. This was as true for the account that David gave of Mary Countess Cowper as it is for Pepys in his 1661 recollections of Charles II's restoration coronation echoing similar themes. Now after all this, I can say that beside the pleasure of the sight of these glorious things, I may now shut my eyes against any other objects. Nor for the future trouble myself to see things of state and show as being sure never to see the like again in this world. Of course he did in 1685 as Baron of the Sank Port for James II's coronation. John Evelyn was so enamored with Charles II's crowning that he wrote a poem for the day presenting it to the Privy Chamber to the King which he was pleased to accept most graciously. London's high society was delighted with proceedings and continued to party. Evelyn attended the Marquis of Ormond's magnificent feast the day after the coronation. The impact of the occasion seemed to have permeated to many Londoners, for on the 1st of May, over a week after the main event, Evelyn reported that he went to Hyde Park to take the air. Where was his majesty and an innumerable appearance of gallants and rich coaches being now a time of universal festivity and joy. Magnificence is a continuous theme. This was a day of impressive proportions in costume, regalia, and personnel. The British public remain interested, indeed seem to care about the royal family, for good or evil, as part of our heritage and cultural identity. This combination has created an ongoing formula for success and therefore importance of royal ceremonial. Despite a fear of irrelevance, royalty somehow has managed to keep itself in the spotlight or perhaps just be kept there by the general public. And this we find that royal events matter most of all because we want them to matter. Relevance is maintained by intrigue in people wanting to know about the traditions. A very clear example of this is the fascination held by other nations, particularly those without a monarchy, such as the US. Without wishing to make this a numbers game, television statistics are important indications of modern trends. The coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953 had 20 million viewers outnumbering the radio for the very first time. Approximately 10 million radio listeners were present, just over half the number of television watchers. 10.4 million watched in their homes of friends and neighbors, one and a half in public places. In the US, 85 million people tuned in to watch recordings and highlights. In 1973, Princess Anne and Mark Phillips' wedding had an estimated 500 million viewers worldwide. Prince Charles, the late Lady Diana Spencer's wedding in 1981, saw 28.4 million viewers in the UK and up to 750 million worldwide. You might think, as The Economist attempted to suggest, that public interest has waned. Yet Prince William and Kate Middleton's wedding in 2011 saw approximately 27 million viewers, just shy of 1981, and almost 23 million in the US. Harry and Meghan's wedding in 2018 also saw significant viewing numbers, over 18 million in the UK and an estimated 29 in the US. Millions continue to view even when there are so many viewing options these days. It's one thing to watch the only programme available 
or from a selection of three or four stations. It's quite another when satellite TV and the internet permits innumerable streaming options. Princess Diana's funeral in 97 had 32.1 million viewers in the UK alone, with over 2 billion globally. Prince Philip's funeral more than 13 million in the UK, and the Platinum Jubilee Party had 13.3 million UK viewers. We should also not forget those at the Mall or participating in celebrations up and down the country, a tradition long held. In 1838, for Queen Victoria's coronation, nearly 500,000 people gathered, along with the farmer we've heard about, in London streets nearby to celebrate. These are staggering statistics, and all the more so when we place them now in a wider context. The finale and most watched episode of Game of Thrones received 13.6 million live viewers. The 1966 FIFA World Cup final, 32.0 million. The 2012 Summer Olympics closing ceremony, 24 million. The 2019 ICC Cricket World Cup had 1.6 billion in live coverage viewers, with 15.4 in the UK. The BBC reported that 32.5 million viewers in the UK tuned in for the Queen's funeral, and several billion worldwide. We can therefore see that royal spectacle is to be viewed. If it did not matter, it would not stand as some of the most watched events globally. Yet what are celebrations out of London? As we've seen, these are not new, and they happened before a mechanized state. There was a sense of community, of unity, of some kind of allegiance to the crown or to Britain or to the state, clearly before some historians think. The Westminster Abbey coronation and metropolitan festivities were accompanied by nationwide celebration. After the restoration, numerous Irish corporations enthusiastically commemorated the anniversaries of both the coronation and the restoration each year, providing alcohol for the local inhabitants and encouraging the construction of bonfires. How do we know these things? David's already alluded to these diaries, to these accounts. We can see them in written accounts, in correspondence, in printed coronation sermons that get passed around. They all reveal the interest and impact beyond Westminster. Coronation sermons, for instance, were printed and distributed and became publications of interest and value, like a borrowable present. And the luxury of exotic tea in the early 18th century. On the 1st of May, 1702, Sir Thomas Rawlinson wrote to John Seeley in London, I've here sent you some Bahia tea, an oolong tea roughly equivalent to Lapsang Souchon, as a present which I desire you to accept. I know it to be good and very wholesome, and with it, the sermon preached at the coronation of Queen Anne, which you may lend, but not give it away, but to keep it. So, to illustrate this further, this reach, I want to end this lecture series on a less dry note. Let us examine the impact through the prism of wine. I might easily have picked tea or spices or any of these other material things. Wine has been a prominent feature of British coronations for centuries, an ever-present element from the earliest records we have in Anglo-Saxon tradition to the Westminster Abbey coronations of 1066 onward. For one, it's been part of the sacramental religious side of the ceremony as the accompanying element to the bread, the bread and the wine, featuring before the Reformation in the Mass and then latter in the Eucharist or Holy Communion of a Protestant Church of England tradition. Secondly, it's been at the core of the festivities that followed the coronation ceremony as part of the royal banquet or feast. The carafe of wine was a focal point of the coronation banquet of Henry the Younger, as you can see there, just up there. In addition, wine has also been consumed in vast quantities in celebrations up and down the country, and those that took place abroad connected with coronations. When we think of great events, of celebrations, of royalty, of pomp and ceremony in the UK, bottles of bubbles, or two, are never far away, and coronations have had champagne at the very heart of the drinking experience. Champagne, of course, comes from Reims in France, the crowning place of French kings, as discussed yesterday. It's therefore perhaps the most suitable ointment for feasting. Traditionally, the coronation banquet took place in Westminster Hall, following the coronation ceremony in Westminster Abbey. Westminster Hall is the oldest building connected with the Palace of Westminster and played a major role in British history as the home to legal courts of the country before the Royal Courts of Justice, hosting famous trials and speeches along with sumptuous feasts. In recent history, it's been the focal point for the laying in state of monarchs, as seen for the late Queen. The last great Westminster Hall banquet was 1821 for George IV. The lavish nature of the occasion did not win the monarch much favour with the public, and this ancient event was discontinued in the traditional setting of Westminster Hall. For 1902, Edward VII's ill health delayed the coronation from the 26th of June to 9th of August, following a pre-coronation feast that was thought to be so lavish 
that it might have brought on the king's illness. He had appendicitis. On the 9th of August, feasting took place in Buckingham Palace, and whilst much of his banquet had long since been given away to charity, two and a, two and a half thousand quails had been given to the poor in Whitechapel, he did not go without, and it was said that there was still enough wine and champagne to float an entire fleet of the Royal Navy's battleships. Elizabeth II's coronation menu provided the nation with a new dish, <coughs> that of coronation chicken. And there were celebratory luncheons at the Guild Hall and two coronation banquets in the ballroom at Buckingham Palace on the 3rd and 4th of June, 1953. What of Champagne? Champagne was at the heart of Edward VII's coronation banquet feast in 1902, a sovereign with a passionate interest in Parisian custom, indeed everything French. The Epicurean monarch made sure his guest enjoyed two options, a Mum 1892 and a Pommery 1893. Moving to the late Queen's coronation in 53, perhaps, with Sir Winston Churchill's enthusiastic support, the assemble enjoyed his favorite Paul Roger 34 vintage. Churchill's hand seems almost certainly likely here. Following liberation of France, he would have been served the 1928 in Paris, and according to his son Randolph, his father brought up all of the 1928 he could get his hands on, and when that ran out, he drank out the entire plentiful supply of 34. Elizabeth II's second reception also included the Krug 1945 option. Then there were champagnes of coronation feast celebrations for Edward VII and Elizabeth II showed this classic indulgent display of consumption and excess. For one, the excess of the Edwardian, the other trying to create a new Elizabethan age on the back of the Festival of Britain, but of course, rebuilding Britain after the Blitz and London post-war. Whilst we've begun in the drinking order of more modern times, we turn our attention further back in history to Riesling wines, or what were often referred to as Hock or Rhenish wines. The name even given gives rise to glasses specifically named Hock. Hock is the traditional generic English term for white or Rhenish wines from the Rhine regions of Germany in general. It's a contraction of Hockheim on the river mine just west of Frankfurt. Whilst Riesling is one of the most devices of grapes and wines, a Marmite wine in the 21st century, our royal forebears and their wider citizens had no such difficulty in placing hot wines firmly within a coronation context. One of the most recorded of early coronation celebrations was that of Anne Boleyn in 1533, and unique in an English context in being the independent crowning of a queen consort. Whilst one might have anticipated a strong Rhenish wine presence to the Tudor court for the arrival of the German Anne of Cleves in 1540, Anne Boleyn had no such Germanic links. Indeed, she's well known for her time at the French court. Nevertheless, the coronation saw a veritable overflowing of German wines, indicating a general availability and popularity in England. And we have a remarkable surviving description of wine fountains from the city of London in 1533, flowing not just for royal observers and for the elite, but for the populace. At Grace Church Corner was erected a Mount Parnassus with a fountain of Helicon. It was formed of white marble. Four streams rose on high and met in a cup above the fountain, which ran copiously till night with Rhenish wine. At the great conduit in Cheap, a fountain ran continuously, at one end white wine, the other claret all the afternoon. That's 1533. Taste vary. It was not so much that people drank wine or beer, the grape or the grain in the early modern world, but rather that early modern citizens of Tudor London consumed substantive quantities of both. Moving to the 17th century in the Stuart world of the Restoration, we find that Rhenish wines are still firmly in vogue. Robert Spencer, the second Earl of Sunderland's cellar, record records of 1666 included 6%. This made up an even larger percentage of his white wine collection. We'll return to the Earl of Sunderland later. In total, over half of his wines were French, but a real reasonable percentage German. The diarist Samuel Pepys watched and recorded in detail the coronation of Charles II in 1661, and as mentioned, he was a baron of the St. Ports, and he's there circled. Here, Francis Sanford's work was deliberately designed to capture how people actually looked. Each person is drawn as their face was meant to look. His diaries include, this is Pepys, at least 29 entries related to Rhenish wine, or perhaps more importantly, a wine tavern or shop. By contrast, Claret only makes up 13 entries. In all, he has 335 entries devoted to wine. It seems that Pepys had a passion for another Marmite item, that of the anchovy, as a food to be paired with his German drinking sessions. 
Thence, with my cousin Roger Pepys, it being term time, we took him out of the hall to Priors, the Wenish wine house, and there had a pint or two of wine and a dish of anchovies, and bespoke three or four dozen bottles of wine for him against his wedding. The diarist John Evelyn also recorded a similar interest in the same wine shop on Cannon Row in the city of Westminster in the 1660s. Digressing briefly, but in the context of trade and commerce, we turn briefly to how a coronation united these two great cities of London. Whilst today London is an all-encompassing term in the medieval and early modern eras, there was a clear distinction between Westminster and the city of London. And this was important in the context of a coronation. To those familiar with Trafalgar Square, you'll know the, of the nearby church St. Martin in the Fields. That church was quite literally in a field, sheep safely grazing. The two cities were thus independently arranged. But in a coronation, a procession would take place of the monarch travelling from the city of London, the Tower of London, to Whitehall and the Palace of Westminster. A coronation thus joined these two cities together, and in so doing, joined both trade and politics under one ceremonial crowning. During the late 1670s and 1680s, Parliament passed various embargoes on French wines and goods during the war with France. Nominally, it was a success and drove customers to Spanish, Portuguese, German and Italian options. It's certainly true that it helped promote Rhenish wines and enthusiasm for such wines more generally, and they increased. That said, new research reveals cunning English merchants circumnavigated the embargo by buying French wines via Spanish, Portuguese, German, and Italian brokers. It's now been worked out that the wine being imported from Portugal, Portugal under a Portuguese origin vastly outweighed the quantity of wine being produced in Portugal. Claret and Burgundy thus arrived just under different country labels, the law of unintended consequences. For James II's coronation in 1685, his table alone... Sorry, let's get to James. Let me get to Methuen, sorry. His table alone was presented with over 600 dishes, and copious quantities of wine followed, not least French and German. With the arrival of the Hanoverians, formerly the new royal house in 1714 with George I, German wines remained a theme in royal cellars and acquired something of a royal blessing. I've skipped a couple, let me just take you back. An account charge from the Royal Collection Archives reveals a charge of £322 for His Royal Highness George I for 22 AMs of Rhenish wine. That's originally a liquid measure used in Germany and the Low Countries, which varied in different places from about 30 to 34 imperial gallons. It's still a feature in South Africa. To give an idea of scale for these feasts, George II's coronation banquet in 1727 that made famous Zadok the priest, his coronation, the music, was lit by over 2,000 wax candles. Royal tastes influenced courtiers. For instance, we know, as mentioned, the Earl of Sunderland in 1666 had a wine cellar that reflected Charles II's interests and those of the fashionable tastes of the Louis XIV, the Sun King. So too, the Duke of Newcastle under George II acquired a passion for German wines. In 1748, George II sent his advisor, the first Duke of Newcastle, to Hanover to develop better how the two dominions could work together. Newcastle not only worked on his political brief, but in so doing, developed an affection for the local wines, and surviving letters in the British Library record his request on his return to England to have his wine shipped over. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Georgian Hanoverian monarchs liked German wines and promoted them. With Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert of saxe coburg and Gotha in 1840, the United Kingdom has enjoyed a familial yet complicated relationship with Germany that's often difficult to understand. The same can probably be said about its relationship to German wines. Some English consumers prized Rhenish wines in the 1830s precisely because of their purity, lack of adulteration and relative dryness, and decreed port for its excess of sweetness and spirit. During World War I and sugar rationing, the post-war British wine consumer may have lost their affection for dry wines. Some even liked those with more age. One German wine was colloquially known as Old Hock. Yet Riesling or Hock wines were a consistent feature at royal banquets in Victorian Edwardian England, whether for Edward VII or even for Queen Elizabeth II. Both entries are somewhat surprising. Edward VII disliked much of German culture of his mother's court and adored all things French. A 1953 coronation was just a few years after the Second World War. Given that rationing was in the process of ending, London still bore, as I've mentioned, the hallmarks of the Blitz, it's strange that this wine option is still there. Tastes and fashions often transcend politics. Turning to, sorry, to the Commonwealth, we also know that Australian reasoning played a part in celebrations for the 1953 coronation of Elizabeth II. In 1953, HMS Sydney brought to London a special contingent of Anzac troops that had won VCs to be in the coronation procession and to take part in a naval review. 
that has been discontinued this year. Whilst Great Britain had street parties, so too did nations of the Commonwealth and great dinner menus as well. Records from a dinner of dignitaries in Canberra shows the consumption of a special banquet, including consomme royale, lobster, roast turkey and ham, asparagus and strawberries. And as to Riesling or Hock, we have two mentions, a um, Riesling Yelumba cart door and a Burring's Old Crusty Hawk private bin. The Queen would also be the first British sovereign to visit Australia in 1954. The crowning banquet uh, of her tour would include a reasoning this time of a Lindemann stable. And here we have some of the celebrations in 1902 in Australia. So just as David had mentioned with Singapore, these things have a far greater reach than perhaps people have appreciated. And here was the royal tour banquet menu. We now turn to claret and a wine style prevalent in coronation banquets feasts for centuries. The British affection for claret's well known. British royal connections with claret goes back to the medieval age, and it's indeed the anglicised term for Bordeaux wine. In one of King John's better moves, in his coronation year of 1199, he gave saint Emilion a royal charter in exchange for rights to the coveted local wines there. It will take a lot to improve his reputation, but this is not a bad start. How it was drunk and in what manner varied to different levels of appreciation. On the night of Charles II's English coronation, on St George's Day 1661, he'd been crowned at Schoon in 1651, Samuel Pepys recorded that he drank the king's health and nothing else, till one of the gentlemen fell down stark drunk and there lay spewing. <laughs> Wine fountains for the general populace to enjoy have already been mentioned in the context of Anne Boleyn's coronation, yet the concept was nothing new. In 1308, for the coronation of Edward II, a fountain in one of the domestic halls spouted red and white wine and a spiced drink known as pimento. The red wine was almost certainly claret. During the 17th and 18th centuries, claret became highly politicized, as we've seen in that other slide, a bastion of Tory sympathy, but dangerously French and Jacobite for Whigs, who favored the wines of Portugal. From the, 17, from the 1680s onwards, pressure grew, I think hopefully, uh, yes, good, um, pressure grew, and the Methuen Treaty of 1703 emerged. The price of wine went up. We know that the price of French wine had more than doubled between 1661 and 1685. Inflation is nothing new too. Yet we still wanted more, and England's love affair with French wine endured. Whilst wine developed into a political football, and battle lines were drawn between Tory and Jacobite claret drinkers and Burgundian enthusiasts and Whig Portuguese and port wine drinkers, in general, the love of French wine dominated over one's political palate. Returning to the second Earl of Sunderland's wine cellar of 1666, over half of his entries were of French origin claret taking up 109 bottles, 191 bottles. Quantity was perhaps as important as quality in the early modern period, as already referenced for James II's 1685 banquet, which was of such a scale that it attracted and generated prints and illustrations that were published internationally and could be seen in an Italian account of James II's 1685 coronation, which was produced in Bologna and Naples. News of the spectacular banquets, which included over 1,134 dishes, from salading to sweetmeats, also spread extensively in the form of receipts. Patrick Lamb, the royal chef, published a recipe book of royal cookery in 1710. Besides place settings, it details receipts from jellies to fricassees of chickens and crawfish or lobster soup. This was so certainly the art and wealth of gluttony. For the business end of the coronation banquet in 1902, Edward VII enjoyed his truffles and brandy sauce in a more delicate manner with an offering of Chateau Dissin thereby paying homage to an ancient connection of that fine estate to the medieval English royal family. Chateau Dissin was served at the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine to King Henry II in 1152. Jumping forward or backwards in this slide to 1953, Elizabeth II's lucky guests were treated to a first growth, the Chateau Lafitte, 1934. So turns. So turns have long graced the dinner tables of monarchs and given their production involves noble rot, there could be little more appropriate for a sovereign. It's perhaps far from surprising that a wine as prodigious as Chateau Chem Vintage 1928 featured Elizabeth II's coronation in 53. And there is still a bottle of the 28 available just off Berkeley Square, showcased this year at a staggering 5,000 pounds. Another oft-mentioned wine of royal reputation is that of Royal Tokai, a wine for Hungarian princes and ultimately reserved by the 1900s for imperial Austro-Hungarian households. Shakespeare, echoing heraldic accounts of Richard III's coronation, shows that such interest in sweet wines was present there. This lecture is not an attempt at the reputational improvement of our lesser-loved monarchs, King John or Richard III, but they both clearly knew a thing or two about wine. Richard III made sure at his coronation banquet of being served by the Lord Mayor a sweet wine of refinement. 
At his feast of 1483, he enjoyed his peacocks, partridge, venison bake, capons, and custards with a plentitude of red wine. But more importantly, in the context of sweet wine, as Shakespeare recounts, there was much consuming of Malmsey, a sweet fortified Madeira wine being served to the king and queen Anne Neville, a sweet wine in a gold cup, and that comes from a herald's account. Shakespeare, in reference to sweet wines of France, Portugal, and the Canary Islands, also feature in plays from Love's Labour's Lost to Twelfth Night, The Merry Wives of Windsor. Returning to Pepys, he mentions on the back of what was clearly a very trying day with workmen, his wife being ill on the 9th of May, 1661, not many days after the festivities of the coronation, he made it up to the Swan Tavern on King Street in Westminster and had a tankard of white wine and sugar. This represented the tastes of the day and matches the cellar accounts of Robert Spencer, which contains a good proportion of wines from Madeira and, the, and Cyprus. Approximately a sixth of his cellar was designated to wines of a sweet nature. The Victorian court matched this, indeed exceeded it. We know what was present in Buckingham Palace because it was the set accompaniment to royal dinners and prescribed by the head chef, Charles Francatelli, um, in, a service at Buckingham, in service at Buckingham Palace in the 1840s and captured in the Victorian television, Victoria television series. Francatelli would serve Chablis or Sauterne as an accompaniment to oysters with sherries or soups. In the 20th century, Sauternes and fortified wines found themselves as part of coronation cocktails developed in the US, from the Brooklyn coronation for George VI in 1937 to a Sauterne cobbler, a mixture of Sauternes with ice or soda, an orange slice, syrup, and seasonal berries. On the sweeter end of grapes, there's even a coronation grape grown in Canada, a table grape popular for the sweetness generated. Beyond Westminster. One not only drinks the wine, one smells it, observes it, tastes it, sips it, and one talks about it. Edward VII, with all his Epicurean tastes, reveled in everything food and wine, as this marvellous quotation attributed to the hedonistic monarch illustrates. He was a true Bacchus, a Dionysus of a monarch. Yet what of those beyond Westminster? How do the wider countries celebrate with wine and beer? An array of records from archives across the UK demonstrate a street party tradition, as David has pointed to already, going back centuries, and accompanied by suitably generous quantities of drink, the Common Council and City Chamberlain in Bristol were responsible for much of the expenditure in 1685 for James II's coronation. They paid for two hogsheads of claret, costing 11 pounds and five shillings, and that the four conduits should run with wine. In All Saints Parish, Bristol, 12 shillings and sixpence were spent on ringing the day the Queen was crowned upon. And this was accompanied by expenditure of four, pound, four pounds for the carrying of wine that was to be consumed. For the coronation of Queen Anne in 1702, receipts demonstrate people spending one pound and 12 shillings on beer and tobacco, the early modern street party. In Stratford-on-Avon, for rich and poor alike, such celebrations were witnessed in different parts of the realm. For instance, the city of Chester Assembly organized Coronation Day celebrations for Britain's new Hanoverian dynasty in 1714. For George I, the Corporation of Bristol, here we are, spent at least 55 pounds on rejoicing this day, which included 10 shillings for two trumpeters, and two shillings eightpence for eight drinking horns, and beer at 10 shillings. These sundry disbursements clearly put music and alcohol at the heart of the jollity, along with cheese and tobacco. In Nottingham, Common Council minutes evidence coronation preparations. On the 27th of January, 1625-6, it was agreed that bells should be rung at every church and bonfires made in the streets to show the people's rejoicing on the day of the king's coronation. Charles II's 1661 coronation saw similar celebrations as far afield as Ireland to Leith, Edinburgh, Cambridge, and Weymouth. We know from Pepys that London beyond Westminster was overflowing with celebrations for the restoration procession and coronation of Charles II. On the afternoon of the procession, he took up a vantage point in the house in Cornhill, the street running between Bank Junction and Leadenhall Street in the city, and he was joined by his wife and colleagues from the Navy office. They had wine and good cake and saw the show very well. This was a spectacle not to be missed. We find the same picture for Anne's coronation in 1702. Shops were searched for silk, convenient to make banners, and to prepare for the coronation. However, on this occasion, when the solemnity was over, there was to be a treat of wine provided at the hall for the better sort of people to drink the Queen's health, and likewise a hogshead of ale for the poor, and that Master Chamberlain do prepare one dozen and one half bottles of canary, three dozen of white wine, three dozen of claret for the purposes of the aforesaid, and likewise half a hogshead of ale from the town officers, and for the constables, and five dozen of French wells, and 10 dozen of white bread. We should note that a hogshead is a significant quantity, some 428 pints in total. Street parties with all the trappings of bunting and so on are familiar today, and they're nothing new. 
the pattern of wine featuring as part of a coronation celebration, both within the Westminster ceremonies and beyond, was widespread and age old. It's not so much that people drank the grain or the grain, but rather the quantities and types that had evolved. Now, all of this to some degree is somewhat humorous, but it points to the material culture, the spreading of this great event from London outwards. Monarchy and wine have thus been entwined for centuries, from the aperitif to the digestive. They've shaped fashionable tastes. They've secured the warrants for progress in the next exciting venture. These days, it might be a high grove gin or English sparkling wine that will dominate the street parties of the UK. Drawing these threads together, we have a celebration that's been part of our culture from as early as records begin, of huge significance in the capital, but more importantly, going far beyond to citizens up and down the land. In just a few days' time, we will learn if this tradition goes beyond the Abbey. Thank you. Well, um, in the last three evenings, we've heard, um, we've heard about the difficult and constitutional impact. We've heard about the religious Learning. 